The Federal High Court in Abuja has ruled that the President, Muhammad Buhari, acted in contravention of the law when he sent the names of 11 candidates recommended to him by the National Judicial Council for appointment as judges of the Federal High Court of the Federal Capital Territory to the Senate for screening and confirmation. Justice Iyangeko made the pronouncement in a suit filed by an Abuja-based lawyer, Ola Dimeji Ekengba, contending that the forwarding of the names of the 11 nominees by Buhari to the Senate was in breach of Section 256, Subsection 2 of the Nigerian Constitution. Buhari had, without explanation, picked 11 names from among the 33 recommended to him in April this year by the NJC for appointment as FCT High Court judges. He forwarded the 11 names to the Senate for screening, but the upper legislative chamber had declined to act on the president's list, having admitted that it had no role to play in the appointment of FCT judges. The 11 judges have since been sworn in by the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Tanko Mohammed. And joining us to discuss this is legal practitioner Akintayo Iwilade and Tunde Kolawale. Thanks for joining us on The Breakfast. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much. Good, good morning. morning. If you can hear me, uh, uh, Akintayo, what's your reaction to the court's judgment? Uh, well, I think that the, the court's judgment just uh, emphasizes the need for us to, uh, I mean, for uh constitutional authorities in nigeria to as much as possible you know always stick very closely and as always to the uh to the letters and intentments of the of the law in taking the uh, in taking decisions and I, I i think the point has been has been made by the learned justice and and and, I, and i'm sure the 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 senate the presidency and everybody involved has has taken note of of, of, of all of that that for, because the, the constitution appears to make only a specific provision that if the appointment were to be for the heads of courts, and then in, the, in that instance, the Senate will be required to either approve or disapprove of such, uh, uh, or confirm such, a, confirm or not confirm such appointment. But where the persons to be appointed are sitting other judges who are not heads of the court at the FCT, then the role of the Senate can be dispensed with. I think that is the simple point the court has tried to make. Okay, bringing you in now, Mr. Kolawale, can you explain more? Wasn't the list in the first place sent by the National Judicial Council or, or is it not the norm? Yes, Mr. Kolawale, you can go ahead. Yeah, repeat your question, Mika. I can't hear you clearly. Okay, we're trying to find out from your legal expertise. Wasn't the list in the first place sent by the National Judicial Council, or is it not the norm for that list to be sent to the NJC? Well, if I get you, if I get you correctly, you are asking whether there is a need for the for the NJC to have sent the list to the president. Is that what you have? Yes, yes, please. OK, absolutely. Well, uh, like I indeed uh, said uh, yesterday, you and I will remain, I mean, we will know that um, most times when appointments are to be made at uh, the Federal Capital Territory, those uh, appointments are directed to the presidency for approval, simply because Abuja, as an administrative unit, does not have a governor, does not have his own legislator. It is the presidency that uh, indirectly, and the minister of the federal capital Territory that precise and take decisions with regards to most of these appointments in Abuja. So I suspect very strongly that it is based on that tradition, uh, that custom, that uh, the Chief Justice of uh, the Federation sent the list uh, from the NJC to the presidency for onward transmission to the Senate for approval. If that be the case, 
I wouldn't think um, it has vitiated or done any grave injustice to so, the appointment of those uh, honorable judges, the 11 judges that have been so appointed. All right, still staying with you, Mr. Kolawale. To the laymen, yeah. how did the president contravene the law? Is it because of selecting 11 out of the 33, or doesn't he have the power to select? Well, the, the president has uh, contravened the law in the sense that he has not adhered to the provisions of Section 256, 1 and 2 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Section 256 says that uh, when a chief judge or the president of the head of court in Abuja is to be appointed, the president should send the name to the National Assembly to the Senate for confirmation. Just like it is done for the chief justice of the Federation and also for the president of the Court of Appeal and uh, the president of the uh, Federal High Court. And then in Section 2562, the appointment of uh, just an ordinary judge for the Federal Capital Territory, the president is not required to send the names of such persons to the Senate or to the National Assembly for confirmation. So by sending this list to the Senate for confirmation, the president has not had their strictly to the provisions of the Constitution. Now let me say this, that uh, this wouldn't be the first time that we'll be seeing the presidency take actions that are not in tandem with the provisions of the Constitution. i give you two, two three examples. We have in the past seen the presidency say they are um, saying they are giving pardons to people who had already been pardoned by previous governments in this country. The cases of Chief Enauro, Ambrose Ali, and some of these other persons are there as reference points. We also recollect that not too long ago, the presidency sent to the National Assembly a bill granting financial autonomy to the legislature and the judiciary in the country. When, in fact, and indeed, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria already made provisions for financial autonomy for both the legislators at the state and the federal level and also for the judiciary. And also, um, we have also seen situations in which uh, names of dead persons, people who already passed on, are uh, listed for appointment and sent to the National Assembly for confirmation. All this uh, is a reflection that somebody somewhere is not paying attention to details. If they were paying attention to details, they wouldn't be making this kind of a mistake. All right, Mr. But Kalawale. Let me say this. Yeah? Go, going back now to the crux of the matter, I'd like to bring back in Mr. Iwiladi to the issue. But the CGN swore in the judge's nominees. So by so doing, did the CGN also contravene the law? Uh, absolutely not. Because the, the, the Senate, from the report you earlier read out before this conversation began, the Senate had already returned and indicated that it didn't have the powers or the authority by the Constitution to confirm or not confirm the, uh, the proposed appointees. And it was after that decision that the said judges have been sworn in. And then if you look at the reports regarding the judgments of yesterday, you would find that his lordship, the judge who ruled on that issue and made a pronouncement, made it clear that while there might have, uh, there, while there was a, uh, uh, a you know, some sort of misstep in the procedure of sending that 
requesting the Senate for confirmation, it does not, in the end, affect or touch on the uh, the uh, the appointments that are already the swearing in that has already taken place. And I need to make a uh, a, a little point that I, if if the you know the the president indeed is the is the uh, constitutional appointer of these judges. So if the, supposing the language of the letter that was sent to the Senate was for, for example, maybe just for the comments or for uh, just some sort of due diligence with members of the National Assembly, if the language was not to seek the confirmation of the Senate, I personally would take a different view that there are perhaps would, would say that there was not a contravention of the Constitution. But because perhaps the language of the letter sought the confirmation of the Senate, because if the president is deemed to be the appointer, he's entitled to seek comments, even from us as everyday Nigerians, he's entitled to seek comments from any, anywhere about the, uh, the persons, the qualification, uh, you know, personal capabilities of the proposed appointees so as to guide his decision in either accepting the nominees presented to him by the NJC or rejecting them. But of course, he, you know, where the, the, the reports are not that he is sought for comments, because I think that it would be within his powers and prerogative as the president to seek comments from you know institutions across the country about the persons we see you know, being sought to be appointed. However, another point that we think we, we, we need to make is that the, the, we, you know, what we are discussing today touches on the constitutional procedure for the appointment of judges. I don't think those are really the, the, the biggest considerations. You know, of course, it's important to follow the letters and spirit of the constitution. Absolutely no doubt about that. But the bigger considerations in the subject of appointment of judges in Nigeria, which we all should be uh, much more concerned about, is the question of whether we are appointing, are making our appointments on the basis of capabilities, on the basis of uh, uh, merit, as against uh, some of the processes that we have seen in you know uh, in, in recent times. For example, if you look at the situation in in, you know, uh, I think in Cross River State, where we have, a, you know, there were reports that it was uh, the, uh, we had the questions around, you know, states of origin, you know, state of birth, place of marriage, all of those things are still being made considerations by uh, legislative leadership in determining, in confirming or not confirming the appointment of, of judges. I think those are the those are some of the real issues that should really embarrass us as, as, a, as a country, that how can we, for example, be determining the appointment of somebody to the position of a chief judge of a state, for example, by on the basis of the, the person's state of origin or place of marriage or place of birth, especially in a country where we are trying to unify ourselves, a nation that is in dear need of uh, unity, how can somebody or persons who have served, you know, in judicial capacity, perhaps the, almost their entire working careers, how can it then be that at the point when they are to be elevated to the apex of, of, of leadership in such, you know, within such a judicial system, how can it then be that we'll be raising questions of, and then be reminding persons or making claims that they do not belong in a particular state, having served that same state for you know, or, or almost like their entire judicial career life. And I think that there has been such an instance too where, you know, uh, uh, one of our lordships, in, you know, I think several years back, was uh, almost denied uh, uh, elevation to, uh, you know, to a higher court, I think an appellate court at the time, on the basis of the place of marriage and, and all, of the, all of those, all of those funny uh, uh, provisions, inappropriate provisions in our guidelines, in our laws, you know, which we need to comb through all our laws within the country, appointment laws, comb through all of this to ensure that there are no discriminatory uh, implications, that there are no discrimination on the basis of gender, on the basis of uh, place of birth, on the 
basis of state of origin and all of those things. So those are the long-term things that I feel are the real issues. Because essentially, in this instance, you know, while the, 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 we have to respect the decision of his lordship, who has said that that procedure adopted wasn't uh, in tandem with the, with the constitution, but thankfully, he also had made it clear that the, it didn't affect the appointment of, of the judges. But the real bigger issues that we should be thinking about as an, in the overall context of it is that we should be, are we making a, appointments on the basis of merit? Are we making appointments without discrimination as to place of birth, you know, state of origin, and, you know, and uh, gender, and any other discriminatory factors? I think those are the real issues going forward uh, uh, for me. Thank you very much. And how about you, Mr. Kalawale? Do you think that uh, the CJN contravened the law by swearing in the judges' nominees? Well, uh, ordinarily, it shouldn't lie in my mouth uh, that uh, the CJN has uh, contravened the law uh, because the CJN is the custodian of the law of the Federation. But be that as it may, I would want to think that once a case is in court, until that case is disposed of, all authorities and municipalities should have waited uh, before taking a for any further step that is there. And with, uh, when the case is before in court, it would appear to be subjective. But because if the decision of the court has gone other way, if my lord has ruled, that the confirmation or the signing of the names of these judges to the Senate for confirmation, uh, it's um, right, or the other way is wrong, and the CGN has gone ahead to send in the people when the case is still before the court, I think his actions will be could be considered to be subject. It could be said that uh, it would have left the court with a fate accomplished. I mean, rendered whatever decision the court may have taken and not get free if the decision had gone the other way. So to that extent, I should think my Lord, the CGN should not have shown him the justices until the court had rules on the application before the court. So to that extent, I think my Lord, the Chief Justice, uh, could be said not to have done well in that regard. Especially when all of us have always been very, very hard on the executive arm of government for taking preemptive action in, in respect of cases that are before the court and then for not obeying court orders and court rulings, and for lacking respect for the rule of law. My Lord, as the custodian of the law, ought to have shown a better example with regards to this case. He should have tallied a while until the judge has been reached in the court before doing the swearing ceremony. And what would you say is the significance uh, of this to... I would like to take it a slightly different view okay, you can on go that ahead. Uh, point. I, I think the question would want to ask is that was there an injunction against the uh, was there an injunction against the swearing in first and secondly we we need to uh, uh, understand that the the appointment of uh, judges in the in the in the final uh, analysis is essentially the decision to appoint or not to appoint is, a, is an exercise of discretion in some sense, both the discretion, especially the discretion of the executive authority. Now, and by, by several principles of law, you cannot injunct against the exercise of a discretion, of a discretionary power of an arm of, of, an arm of government. Because that would, that would essentially mean that we are uh, interfering with principles of separation of powers and, and, and all of that. So if the, if the president has made that appointment, 
if the president has already made the appointment upon the uh, response from the Senate saying that they would, uh, they would rather dispense with the process of confirmation since they are not constitutionally empowered to do that, I do not think that the process of the appointment, the process should have been stalled because of that, those principles of law that says that you cannot injunct against the exercise of a discretion, except we are saying that the appointment of uh, uh, judges, the decision to appoint a particular person or particular persons into the position of judges is not an exercise of... It is a discretionary exercise of power by the president because he is at liberty to either accept the advice or the recommendation of the NJC or to reject it. And to that extent, that places that... Uh, exercise in the realm of discretion. And the principle is that you cannot injunct the exercise of a discretionary. So supposing, for example, somebody approaches the court and makes, puts a claim before the court to say that the Senate, for example, should not sit, or that the House of Representatives should not sit, or that the Federal Executive Council should not sit, or that the court itself should stop sitting in, in Nigeria. Are we going to say that because such an action has been filed in court, that we then hold back the apparatus of state, we, we, we keep the will of the, you know, at the arms of government at, at a standstill pending the determination of such a matter, even if such matter goes on, as we know in Nigeria can go on for more than a year, two years in some instances and all that. So I would take a slightly different view that the moment that appointment has been made by the president, has been made by the president, because he's the appointer in the real sense of the word, then the swearing-in ceremony is a duty incumbent on the Chief Justice of Nigeria to immediately, you know, uh, validate the appointment that has already been. It is not the swearing-in that validates, uh, that, that, that was the basis, that was the appointment that implied the appointment of those judges. It was that singular act of the president confirming and accepting the appointment that makes them judges. The swearing in part of it is a formality of the process. Of course, they cannot begin their functions until after the swearing in by virtue of uh, protocols and all of, all of that. But the appointment takes effect from the moment the president makes it. And the, the, the making of the appointment, the decision on the appointment, is an exercise of executive discretion, which you, nobody can injunct against. You can't injunct against the exercise of discretionary powers of any arm of government. Otherwise, we are going to place, anybody will file an action. For example, somebody can put an action in court and say the Senate should not even look at the budget. For example, they shouldn't debate the budget. Would that mean, are we going to say that because that action is in court, we would hold the hands of an entire arm of government from performing duties that are already uh, you know, in, you know, imposed on it? or mandated on it by law. In this question of exercise of discretion, the position of the law from case law principles is that you can challenge the exercise of that discretion after it has been exercised. You can challenge the exercise of discretion to question whether it was judiciously exercised or it was exercised in tandem with the law. But you cannot predetermine how a discretion should be exercised. It's quite narrow point of law, but there's a clear distinction that you cannot stop a discretionary exercise before the discretion is exercised. You can't stop it prior to its exercise, but you can challenge it after it has been exercised, you know, to say that perhaps it didn't follow the law or it should have been exercised this way as against, as against that way. So I'll take a slightly different view that the CJN indeed would have been contravening the law if he refused to uh, or if he held on to the swearing in because the appointment process has already crystallized upon the president's express appointment and uh, uh, confirmation of these judges. So that's a slightly different view I would, I would, I would take on that. Mm. So, Mr. Iwalede, what then is the significance of this federal high court ruling to judicial jurisprudence? Can you hear me? Well, I will try to get uh, reconnect with uh, Mr. Willady. Mr. Kolawale, can you hear me? Yes, I 
Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. I'm sorry, I can hear you now. Okay, we're trying to find out from yeah. you, following your train of thought, what you then think the significance of this judgment is to judicial jurisprudence, Mr. Iwiladi. Well, the, 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 the most important significance of it, and I think like Mr. Uh, Kola Ole mentioned, he, did, uh, he, he mentioned that it's important to pay attention to the details of, of, the, of the law, and then it's, it's, it's also uh, indicative that where an arm of, it, 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 it sort of uh, strengthens the principles of separation of powers and checks and balances, whereby where the, uh, the executive or the legislative arm of government is not exactly on all fours with the letters and intents of the law, the judiciary is always there to make some of these clarifications, just like his lordship did yesterday. And also, where the uh, judiciary too is, uh, 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 where any actions on this part of judiciary also operates outside the law, there are also uh, judicial, legislative, and executive processes to check all of those things. So it, I, I think it strengthens the principles of uh, uh, separation of, of, of powers, strengthens the principles of checks and balances, and also uh, behoves on every person who is in an advisory capacity to also always look very closely at the letters and you know of the law. But I think that more importantly, the action. Uh, uh, I personally would think that uh, uh, where, where we have to be bound by the decision of my lord because that's the position. It remains the position of the law, except set aside on. On appeal, so my lord has made pronouncement on that process as being not exactly on all fours with it. But like I said, the president is at liberty to seek comments from any section of society about how you know to guide him as to you know him or her as to how to exercise a discretion or how not to exercise it. I personally, regardless of this decision of the court, I would still still think that if, for example, in future appointments. There is an, a need to appoint judges to a, a superior court or otherwise that the president or a governor is empowered to do. I don't think there's any arm in sending a correspondence to an arm of government to request for, in this instance now, their comments. So if the, if the language, maybe we should just, going forward, look at the language of some of these communications and ensure that they are not, you know, any way outside the, the intendments of the law, but I, I absolutely do not think there's anything wrong in a president seeking the comments of an arm of government as important as legislator to say, you are the representatives of the people. These persons have been presented to me by the leadership of the judiciary to be appointed as judges. What are your thoughts about this? And of course, the only difference is that in the case of a, a judge who is not the head of a court, those comments would only at best guide the president in coming to a final decision, but it would not be bound by then, as in the, as if it were the case of a head of a court where a confirmation or otherwise would have to be made to validate the president's decision. Thank you. All right, Mr. Kolawale, your colleague just said that this challenges the principle of separation of powers. Well, how about you? What do you think is the significance of this on judicial jurisprudence? Well, uh, I have thought I have tried to study the judgment and all that. As far as I'm concerned, I don't see anything that um, this case is contributing to our uh, jurisprudence. In fact, in my humble opinion, it's one of such cases that are taken to court by uh, busy body persons and um, uh, to the extent that uh, a mere letter drawing the attention of the presidency so the mistake that they have made would have sufficed in this matter. When you reach our court, 60% of the cases in the Nigerian court are not supposed to be there. They just merely take those cases to court to congest the court uh, ducat. I would have uh, said that uh, public interest litigation is good, but in exercising public interest litigation or in embarking on public interest litigation, we should be mindful of the resources that are dissipated, of the time that is wasted, of the ducats of the court that is congested. Because 
I mean, the case as far as I'm concerned is a mere academic exercise, which is not worth the while. Lastly, I mean, uh, furthermore, let me also go back to the contribution of my colleague who says uh, the CGN hasn't contravened any law with regard to the confirmation of, uh, I mean, with regard to the swelling of um, the 11 judges, even when the case was before a court of uh, competent jurisdiction. I beg to disagree with him. It is elementary principle that um, when the case is before a court, all parties should maintain the status quo. And we as lawyers, we as judges and all that, are supposed to show very, very good example in those respects. I give you an hypothetical exam uh, example. If my Lord Honorable Joseph Pope had struck down the training ceremony of the appointment of those judges, what would have happened? Would my Lord the CJ not have been put in an embarrassing position? The mere fact that my Lord Honorable Joseph Pope made ref I mean um, made a pronouncement that the training ceremony of those judges does not vitiate the appointment for me shows that my Lord is conscious that there are issues with regard to the action that the CJN are taken. And it is to save the CJN from any embarrassment that uh, my Lord has addressed uh, uh, that issue. So I still want to insist that uh, when the matter is before a court of competent jurisdiction, we require as parties, as uh, uh, people who have interest in such. All right, Mr. Kalawale. Uh, finally, before I let you go, I'd like to find out uh, your opinion. What do you think is the uh, basically the implication of this judgment? Are these sworn in judges going to lose their jobs? Ah. Uh Ab absolutely not, because the, the, the judgment has made it clear that regardless of the earlier comments of my Lord on the, on the procedure and the uh, non-essential uh, or, 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 or the unnecessary nature of re expecting the Senate to make a confirmation or otherwise, so regardless of that, that view that my Lord has taken, the appointment stands and it's remained valid in law. And then on a on a lighter note, with, uh, I mean the the beauty of conversations when you have this uh, where you have two lawyers. So when you have two lawyers, you must be prepared for uh, diverse uh, opinions uh, and all of that. So I I take the the good point of my you know learned colleague on the issue of the sometimes. Uh, uh, prudence that is required, you know, in the exercise of uh, public interest litigation, and I would think that that's a that point he made regarding, you know, just doing a simple letter to call the attention of the authorities might just have been might just have uh, sufficed. I I I think that's a uh, you know that that that's an instructive point, you know. However, the on the only subject of uh, 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 the only subject of disalignment is this question that if it is not every case that is in court, even by principles of law, it's not every case that requires that parties should stand still and all of that. And we've given, you know, examples. So, for example, suppose somebody takes a case to court today and say that the Federal Executive Council should not sit or I think the case to court, like I rightly pointed out, the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria should not sit pending the determination of this action. Or takes a court to say the Federal House of Representatives should not sit to consider the budget of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Or takes a position to say that the uh, president or vice president of a country should not be sworn in after an election has taken place and INEC has uh, taken a position. Are we going to say that just on the basis of that action being in court, all the authorities must then hold their, their hands and say that they cannot take an action 
and then leave the country on a standstill until those decisions are, are taken. So there are, each case is taken on its own individual merits. You know, it's not an all size fits all. Each case is taken on the on its own individual merits, and then we, you know, the, there are instances where certain exercise, certain duties, certain rights, certain discretion cannot be injected against. But of course, this will take uh, an entire back and forth uh, uh, polemics. But I think that this is one of such instances where that principle that you can't injunct against an, a discretion would apply. And I take the view that uh, my Lord indeed did not contravene the law by swearing in their lordships. Mm. And, and how about you, Mr. Kalawale? What do you think is the implication of this judgment? The implication of the judgment? Yes, please. Well, uh, the implication of the judgment is that uh, it has again uh, put the executive arm of government uh, in bad light, like I said earlier on. It has shown that they don't pay attention to details. And uh, in some other clients, sanctions would have been applied because the uh, governance is in your business. People who don't pay attention to details when they are supposed to pay attention to it have no business managing the affairs of a nation. Uh, that is one. I would also want to say that um, in future, even though my colleagues will not agree with me, uh, the chief judge should have carried in class uh, before doing the training ceremony. All the cases and instances that my colleagues mentioned, they are not on all four, they are not similar. They don't correspond with the situation that we have in our hands. The family executive, the the Abu, I mean, the judicial system in Abuja will not have been paralyzed. It might not be PJM, but tell the little why in doing the twenty six months of those uh, judges. So that's uh, the contribution I want to make. Thank you so much, Mr. Iwiladi and Mr. Kolawale, for sharing your thoughts on this issue on The Breakfast. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much Pleasure. for having both of us.